Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? I know I did before I started this. You know, I had tons of questions that I didn't have the answers to. You know, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps people, you know, like to listen to? How do I make money off of it? Um, you know, really, and all these answers were simply answered by Anchor. You know, Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And I cannot specify that enough. It is so easy, Um, especially for somebody like me. I'm lazy, although I am tech savvy and I can do all this manually myself. I don't want to. Um, So it's great. And now Anchor... Uh, can match you up with great sponsors who want to advertise on that on your podcast. So that means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's what I'm doing right now by reading this ad. And, you know, as people listen to this ad and listen to my podcast, I will get more and more money to this and, you know, hopefully maybe be able to be self-efficient with this. So if you always want to start a podcast and make money, go to anchor.fm forward slash start it's anchor.fm forward slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcaster already use anchors and I can't wait to hear your podcast welcome to the Kaha club roll up let's take a rip never tell you the world is yours yeah bish and let's go. Um, Kyle High Club, uh, in May episode number 18. This will be RDA, uh, Rafael Dos Anjos first Kevin Lee recap, uh, starting from the very first fight till the end. And I'll have some, some news that has happened recently between the last episode and this one. I'll be at the end. Uh, I'll try to breeze through this motherfucker. And no uh, fights coming up this weekend, so no preview episode. A uh, week after that, I believe June 1st, uh, is a Stockholm card uh, between Alexander Guff, uh, Gustafson and um, Anthony Lionheart-Smith. Uh, that's the main event. I don't know who else is on that card. Um, but yeah, um, so the first fight of the night was between Julio Arce and Julian Arosa. Julian Juicy J. Arosa. Um... First round, I didn't know how to score it. Uh, it seemed like both guys were kind of just going back and forth, feeling each other out. So, um, you know, they both landed, but it was it was a feel them out round. So I gave it nine nine. I don't. I honestly didn't know who to give it. Uh, second round, definitely to. Uh, well, I don't know about definitely, but I gave the second round to Julian Arosa. He just had more pressure and landed more often. Uh, just kind of outpointed Arce. Um, Although Arce did have the cleaner shots and the more damaging strikes. Uh, so I wanted of if somebody scored it the other way, if they gave Arce that round, I could see that too. I just thought even though Arce was doing the more damage, Arosa was just the busier guy and just out pointing. Um, but nonetheless, it didn't matter. <laughs> Essentially, because round three came around and uh, Arce connected with a beautiful head kick and knocked out uh, knocked out Julian Arosa cold, you know, just to start off uh, a great night of fights. Just amazing card of fights. Um, this card has actually had the most finishes of any 2019 card so far. Um, didn't tell me how many. How many finishes were there? One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine out of 13 fights were finishes. That's just crazy. Um, so it was, it was a good card, good fights, uh, good matchups, good shit by the matchmakers. And this one got started off with a bang. Um, Arce looked really good, and I look forward to seeing him in there in the cage uh, next time. Uh, I think Julian Arosa, he's lost. Let me see my preview notes. Uh, this is his second sit in the UFC, and now it's 0 and 3. Um, and one in five overall now, so I don't know. We'll see where he goes from there, from here, I guess. Um, next fight is between Zach Cummings uh, and Trevin Giles. 
first round was a kind of feeling out round. Um, both guys landed, um, but not too much. Uh, Giles definitely was more athletic um, and I guess smoother fighter, so to say. Um, but Cummings is just a wildly vet, wildly veteran. I don't even know if I use that correct. I know the wily coyote, but <laughs> um, um, Cummings stayed in there. He stuck in there. The second round, I wasn't really sure who won that round either. So first two rounds, I gave nine nine, and again, it didn't even fucking matter because come um, come second round. Um, Cummings landed uh, a beautiful left overhand that dropped uh, Giles. And as um, as Giles kind of defensively, you know, was defending himself, he got knocked down and just kind of, you know, was trying to go for a defensive takedown, kind of a reactive takedown to try to, you know, show the ref you're, you're still there. Uh, as uh, Cummings was doing that, he sunk in a beautiful guillotine, uh, dropped to his back and just... And, you know, clamped it down, cinch, cinched it in, and um, got the tap there in the third round of uh, four minutes and a second into the round. Uh, so with less, with a minute left, got the got the finish there. I have no idea how it would have gone in the judges' card. I'm interested in uh, – they need to start displaying that. I, I feel like they probably do. Um, but they need to, like, officially display the judges' cards even when it's a finish because I'd be curious to see how – they judge the earlier rounds. Um, uh, so it was a good performance by Cummings. Giles did get his first uh, professional loss, and obviously that's a bummer, but I'm sure he'll grow from it. Um, how old was he? He's only 26 years old. Um, it's that first loss. He was 2-0 in the UFC. Um, I'm sure he'll grow and get better. He seemed very athletic, and I think they, and during the fight uh, they were talking to him, he still has a full-time job. Um, and I believe he just might have moved his family and now is, like, with a legit camp. Um, after this fight, I don't know what his paychecks are, but, you know, if he can recover quickly enough, he might be able to do this full-time and just progress even more. Um, Cummings, I mean, he he's going to be on the UFC roster as long as he wants. Um, and he'll get fights whenever he wants and whoever he calls out as long as it's reasonable. Uh, great fighter. I love watching him fight. Goes to show it's not always a more athletic or quicker or stronger guy. Cummings, Cummings was probably the stronger guy. He just got that man strength um, being 34 years old. But, um, you know, all it takes is one punch. It's a fight. That's, that's what it comes down to. Anything could happen. And talking about anything could happen, this next fight was just fucking crazy for as long as it lasted. <laughs> Uh, this is one of the more exciting fights of the night. I mean, that's a night of fights that every there was eight other finishes, but this one was just bizarre. I might actually go and watch it again just because it was so crazy. Um, fucking bar burner, uh, Cummings. Uh, I mean, just to start off, these the, uh, I didn't even tell you who the fight is between, but it's between uh, Patrick Cumming, Cummins, Pat Cummins, and Ed Shortfuse Herman. Both guys are just straight savages. Cummins has probably got one of the best mustaches in the game. Uh, Ed Herman, short fuse Ed Herman is just fucking savage. Probably a psychopath. I don't know him personally, but that's the vibe I'm getting. And who knows where he'd be if he wasn't a fucking professional fighter. Um, you probably say that for a lot of these guys. But uh, nonetheless, um, and these guys went back and forth, and they're both tagging each other, just trading back and forth. Not much. I mean, there was technique in there, but not much defense going on. Uh, both are just going for the fences. And Pat Cummins actually had um, Herman stumbling, you know, stumbling, bumbling, fumbling. Um, was his feet and his balance. Uh, but then uh, Herman got the clinch. And just landed a beautiful knee on the exit. And it kind of just, uh, in real time, as it happened, it looked like it was just a glancing knee. But they replayed it, um, you know, afterwards. And the knee, although it, he didn't hit him with the entire knee, he got a good piece of his fucking head. And I think it was right by, like, the equilibrium spot on your brain, like the side of your brain. Um, cut on your temple. Um, and he... Um, 
you know, Cummins kind of stumbled a little bit, uh, lost his equilibrium, and then, um, once Herman sh- smelled that blood, he's like a fucking great white shark in there, um, and just came in and finished it, and it was just, it finished it, uh, three minutes and 39 seconds in, so, <laughs> for those three and a half minutes, man, that was fucking exciting, uh, that was a great, great fucking fight, uh, congrats to both guys, um, yeah, it was a great fight. Uh, as far as the next fight, it was between Michael Trezano and Grant Dawson. Um, and this is a fight between two uh, up-and-comer coming guys. Uh, Trezano was Ultimate Fighter 27 winner, and Dawson came from the Contender Series, Season 1, Week 6. Um, guys, they're both, uh, well, not both, but... Uh, Trezano's 27, Dawson's 25, so you got some up-and-comers here. It's good to see some young talent. Um, fourth fight of the night. Uh, first round was back and forth. Um, but I think uh, Trezano was getting the better on the feet, but Dawson uh, definitely got it. In, I think he got him on the ground. I can't remember. I didn't write too many notes for this fight. I guess I was distracted. Probably just high. Um And, oh yeah, he did have a takedown, but then um, Trezano got back to his feet. And Come the second round, uh, Dawson Digg got a takedown, just held uh, Trezano down there, and eventually got his back and got the rear naked choke. Two minutes and 27 seconds in. Uh, that was Dawson's 14th professional win. He's 14-1. and one. Um, What was his record in the UFC? Oh, he only had one fight. So he now 2-0 in the UFC. And Trezano, was this uh, his first loss in the UFC after winning his debut versus Violent Bob Ross, Luis Pena. Um, so, I mean, both guys look good, and I'm sure they'll, they'll stick around for a little bit. Dawson looks uh, legit, and definitely look forward to seeing him um, back in the cage. I look forward to seeing both these guys back in the cage. Uh, the next fight was between Danny Roberts and Mike um uh, Michelle, I can't remember how they said in the broadcast. Be- Michelle Perriera, um, definitely butchered that name, but you're gonna, I'm gonna want to get it right, and so are you. This guy's a fucking superstar. He's a fucking Brazilian superstar, just waiting, uh, just waiting to pop. Um, <laughs> this man fights crazy. This man, you know, is just hype. He dances crazy when. They announced his name or as soon as he got in the cage. He was doing like some break dancing and just, you know, spinning around like it's fucking You Got Served, the, the fucking movie. Um, and I was just like, what the fuck? This, you guys wasted so much energy right now. And then he came out to fight and it was all, it was the same shit. This man's throwing spinning, just spinning kicks, spinning back fists, elbows, fucking everything, flying knees and just nonstop. And it's just like, you know, can the guy sustain this for all three rounds? And after this fight, we still have the same question because he he knocked out uh, Danny Roberts in the fucking first round, a minute and forty seven seconds in, not even two minutes. Um, so we won't know until he fights somebody else. But oh my god, it was just fucking electric flying. Um, Michelle got he. I think he was getting tagged too, but he got a flying knee, and that's basically what stumbled and hurt uh, Roberts, and then just with a straight right, just put him down, and it was ba- it was basically done after that straight right. He got he was pretty much unconscious. Um, if he wasn't, he definitely was once um, Roberts had hit the back of the fucking canvas. And that always gets me the worst because it's like, damn, ow. Back of the head's the worst in the full force of fly, of just collapsing on your head. Scares me. But um that's what happened. You could see the eyes roll his eyes roll in the back of his head as he was hitting the ground. It's just wild. Um yeah. Barriera is legit. Uh I definitely look forward to seeing that motherfucker back in the cage. And Roberts didn't seem like no slouch, it's just I don't think he knew what to expect from that. and I um, probably wasn't expecting that. 
As far as the next fight, it was between Desmond Green and Charles Air Jordan. Um, Desmond Green was a hometown fighter. He's from Rochester, so he had been talking all the week, and they kind of been promoting him, you know, since a, this event was in Rochester, New York, out of the, what was the arena called? The Blue Cross Arena. Um, he said it was always a dream for him, him to, you know, perform in that arena, and now he's doing it. He had, like, thousands of people there for him, blah, blah, blah. Um... I mean, he's an exciting fighter, and I'm saying this fight wasn't exciting. Um, I gave him all three rounds. Um, and so did two of the judges. One of the judges had a 29-28, which I'm not sure where you're smoking, bro. Um, but anytime he did anything, the crowd just fucking erupted like it was the fucking main event. And it was like McGregor fighting in Ireland. Um, maybe not that crazy, but it was... It was very electrifying for a the co-featured prelim, if that's a thing. It's not, but it's the second to last fight on the prelims. Uh, most electrifying second to last fight prelim fight I've ever seen, as far as the crowds, the physical crowd that is there reaction. Um, and I mean, it wasn't a boring fight, but compared to the rest of the fights where there was nine out of thirteen knockouts, this was one of the one of the most boring fights. It wasn't that boring, as I said, though. Um, you know, Desmond Green looked good. I just thought he kind of held... I don't know if he held back a little bit, but he... You know, I don't know. Maybe... I don't know. It didn't seem like the pressure was getting him or anything like that, but it didn't seem like he put it all out there. But that's my opinion. Obviously, I don't know the guy. I don't know his strategy. Blah, blah, blah. I'm coming from a very ignorant point of view. So if you're listening to this, and this is where you're getting your information, there are better resources. But nonetheless, I appreciate you listening, and I love you. <laughs> um, um, da, 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 da. And, you know, honestly, even though I thought Desmond Green won all three rounds, and so did two of the judges, uh, I was more impressed with uh, Jordine in this fight, even though he was kind of getting technically out, not even kind of, he was getting technically outmatched and just... Uh, Desmond Green's an exceptional athlete as well, um, and you know better athlete than Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. Who knows? Um, but you know he never stopped coming forward. He never, you know, he never looked for a way out. He kept going. He kept fighting, and he kept throwing strikes. So I mean, that's probably why Desmond Green did. His, at least as I said earlier, looked like he left some in the cage. He probably did. It's just we should credit Jordan for putting on a pretty, a- pretty impressive effort. You know, considering a. He might have been the biggest uh, underdog on the card. Um, let me just look at my notes. I have it written down right here. Yeah. From what I've written down is... No, no. He also was. But he was the, maybe the second uh, biggest underdog on this card. So, with that being said, I thought, you know, he looked pretty good. And he definitely deserves to be in the UFC. Um, as far as the featured prelim, that was between Aspen Ladd and Cijara Eubanks. Um, and I scored this very differently than all three judges, um, so I think I need to go back and rewatch this fight, even though there are shit judges out there, but, uh, I might have been distracted for some reason or another, um, but, um, round one... Uh, Aspen Blad did get a very had a very nice power slam. Had better output, more damage on the feet. Oh no, 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 no. Sorry. Round one, Sajara Eubanks had a power slam, and I thought she had better output and damage on her feet. And she ended on top of the round with ground and pound. And I thought it was very close to finishing that round. Um, and Aspen Blad really didn't do much of anything else. I thought. That potentially it could have been a 10 8 round because if the bell had not, you know, if the round had not ended when it did, if there was another minute to that fight, for sure, she's probably finishing uh, Aspen Lat. So I think if you didn't give her that round, I don't know what you're looking at. Um, that's just what I saw. Aspen Lat definitely had her moments the first round. She had uh, 
I believe a takedown and some uh, ground control and had a little, you know, ground and pound in there. But I thought overall Eubanks had the better round for sure, especially when she was very close to finishing, her, I thought, um, you know, there in the end. And she wasn't as close as it's like, oh, I mean, the referee was probably starting to step in, but, well, because the round was ending. But, um, you know, she wasn't like one or two punches away. It was probably a good, you know, 10 to 15, but her defense didn't look like it was all there um, but I don't know again I might have to rewatch it but I definitely thought Eubanks won that first round um, which I mean I could, yeah one of the judges well yeah so I don't know um, come the second round Aspen Ladd did have a takedown Got her back, almost got a choke in, had a nice head crank, and basically a ground and pound for plus three minutes. Uh, just controlled that entire round for the most part on the ground. Uh, she definitely won that round. I don't think it was a 10-8 round, though. If the first round's not a 10-8, this one definitely wasn't 10-8. Excuse me. Um, and come the third round, even though I'm Aspen Lab fan, she's got that Viking DNA. She's cute. Uh, saying Eubanks isn't cute. I am saying she doesn't have Viking DNA. I mean, she might. I haven't seen her 23 Me or whatever. Um, but I thought, I just thought Eubanks had more damaging output in that third round, so I gave that round to, um, to her, and reluctantly so. Um, but to my, not to my dismay, but to my surprise... Um, Eubanks ended up getting the victory, or Aspen Ladd ended up getting the victory, and I think the commentators were saying that they thought Eubanks won as well. Um, but guess not. Um, the judges had it 30 26, 29 27, and 29 28 all in Ladd's favor. Um, which I, I can't believe I had 29 28 to Eubanks. If anything, I would have had it 29 27 to Eubanks. Uh, again, maybe I need to rewatch the fight, but I don't know. I think maybe that Eubanks actually won, and the judge or the scoring's right, but no, nah, there's no way. I don't fucking know, man. There's no way you can give thirty twenty six to anybody. In my opinion. I don't know. Whatever. I guess that's why they don't pay me to be a judge. Um. Hmm. Next fight and the opener on the main event was between Davi Ramos and Austin Hubbard. Um, what was that? The eighth fight of the night. Fight of the night. Uh, round one. Ramos uh, threw some heavy punches. Had a takedown. Blah blah blah. Uh, control at the end of the round. So I gave him that first round. Um, and honestly, the most of the fight was kind of a ground game. It wasn't a boring fight, I, but uh, it was essentially Ramos just uh, not dominating, but at least controlling the majority of the positions on the ground and kind of just beating up Hubbard and kind of showing that Ramos was on a different level. Um, might only be one level above, but he was on another level, especially when it came to the ground. But uh, Hubbard, Austin Hubbard, is a fucking tough, tough son of a bitch. I even wrote that down in my notes. Tough SOB. Um, in the third round, he actually had a knockdown. And, uh, you know, that was really the only... You know, he had some other positive fights, but the... Really the only moment of the fight that jumped out, besides him taking a beating and not giving up, uh, that stood out. Um, so, I mean, good performance by Ramos and... Was that uh, Hubbard's debut? Yeah, it was a USC debut. Um, so I gotta give him a little leeway. He's fighting a guy who was on three fight win streak, who's had four fights in the UFC and a superior ground game in the Tasmanian Devil, uh, Davi Ramos. Um, so maybe get another chance. I think he should, but uh, maybe fights Juicy J. Julian or and they're not even the same weight class, are they? Probably not even close. 155, uh, 10 pounds off. I'm sure there's somebody like that, though. You know, I'll fight a guy that may or may not be on the way out. 
Um, but again, I'm not a matchmaker, so don't do what I say. Uh, the next fight of the night was between Charles Oliveira and Nick Lentz. And I said before, I can't believe this wasn't a bigger fight on the car. Um, it was a good fight, and Oliveira is fucking legit, and I think people are sleeping on him. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, he did fight Nick. I mean, I'm not putting down Nick Lentz, but he's not a top 10 guy. But he's a tough son of a bitch, and he's going to bring a fight to you. And you're going to have to fight that motherfucker. You're going to have to finish him to win it. Because uh, it's the only way you're going to win. And that's how Oliver won. Uh, first round, he had uh, he had better striking and a ground game. And I, th- you know, I thought hands down won that round. It wasn't a 10-8 round, but definitely outpointed him on the feet and on the ground. Uh, he's some of the best jiu-jitsu in the game, if not the best, as he has the most submissions um, in the UFC history. Round two, uh, he dropped he dropped a Lentz with a punch and actually hammer-fisted him to end it. Uh, it was his first knockout since 2010. And that gives him five straight wins with five straight finishes. And he actually, you know, he dropped him by catching a kick and then threw a right straight, just right down the pipe. Uh, you know, like, Lentz was obviously off balance, has momentum going forward. Get a kick caught, you're pretty vulnerable. We just, boom, tagged him, hammer fist ended. it. Uh, so good performance by Lentz, or Oliveira. He can show that not only can he finish you with his multitude of submissions, he can also finish you with his striking, which I thought his striking, I've seen fights several times in the past, I thought his striking is good, he can hold his own, but if it, you know, if he even starts to beat you up on the feet, then you're fucked because where else are you going to go, you're going to go to the ground, because he's definitely going to tap you out, um, so I mean, I'd like, I'd like to see Oliver versus another top 15, top 10 guy, um, you know, he was ranked 14th um, when this fight took place. Got the win. Um, so we'll see where he goes from there. Uh, good performance by him. And we'll see what Nick Lentz does as well. You know, this is his fucking 42nd pro uh, fight, which is just insane. Uh, the next fight was between Vincent Luque and Derek Krantz. Um, Luque was originally supposed to fight Neil Magny in the co-main event. Um, Magni tested positive for a banned substance, and then Derek Krantz came in and fight short notice. Uh, it was a couple days notice, and he was actually on Dana White looking for a night. Uh, the latest episode is the first episode of this new season. I think it's the fourth season. Um, and he fought, I think, was he the main event? Yeah, he was the main event of that of that card, I think it was an LFA event, uh, I think it's League Fighting Alliance, is that what it stands for, I don't know, but, um, he fucked the guy up in that, and then, you know, I'm not sure when that was taped, and when they produced that, but they released it, like, a week before this fight, and then he's fighting in a couple days, so, um, I'm assuming it's a quick turnaround, it was short notice, and they stepping in versus top, uh, top 15 guy in Vincent Luque and although he's fighting definitely a guy in a couple levels down in Derek Krantz as far as technique uh technique and uh, technical ability and even athletic ability um Krantz is one of those fighters that always goes forward and he's going to give you a challenge no matter what kind of like Nick Lentz as well kind of like Justin Gaethje Gaethje is very technical um and ferocious and obviously another level but um Kind of same mentality, you know, just moving, head down, tunnel vision, I'm fucking this guy up until he he's, has to finish me. Um, and Luque noticed that very early on. They traded back and forth uh, early, and Luque definitely, uh, I think, felt his power. Uh, Krantz uh, probably felt Luque's power as well, but just kept charging forward like a fucking psychopath. Um <laughs> And let's see, it's my preview episode in my 
recap episode notes are out of order because of the Neil Magny um, suspension, so the fights kind of changed around as far as the order, so it's confusing me. Um, we just talked about the Oliveira fight. Mm, that was 211. Okay, so this is the 10th night of the fight. Um. I may even take notes for this fight. Well, I've, I think I've already kind of explained most of it. Um, Christ just ch- charged forward, and eventually Luke a just punched him a bunch, knocked him out. Um, I was really stoned and distracted during that fight, but it was a good fight. <laughs> um, next fight was between Megan Anderson and Felicia Spencer, and I am very upset at myself for not seeing this coming. I should have fucking knew it was coming, I don't know what I was thinking, especially I just watched Felicia Spencer a couple days ago, and re- and f- saw that her, you know, she won the Invicta FC Championship at 145, essentially by using her wrestling skills, and I forget who, who she fought, it might have been Tanya Evinger, um, but she fought for the title, and just completely dominated in, in the wrestling atmosphere and on the ground. And so I should have known that this was going to happen. I saw Megan Anderson make her USA debut versus Holly Holm. Holly Holm doesn't even, isn't known for her takedown at all. She's a world kickboxing champion multiple times. Um, but Holly Holm easily took her down and just held her down for the entire fight. And, you know, although that was almost a year ago now, um, two fights ago, it's only a year and not even, um, and while I know Megan's working at a good camp, and I fucking love her, and <laughs> I'd have her, I'd have her babies. Um, <laughs> um, what? She, uh, she has absolutely no ground game. Absolutely none. Uh, and she's fighting a smaller, and I think less heavy, uh, individual in Felicia Spencer, and she took her down. You know, it wasn't with ease, but she took her down, and once she was down, she couldn't get up. Uh, she looked very uncomfortable, and like she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, didn't, I mean, I don't have any room to talk. I don't know anything either, um, except for what I've seen other people do, I guess. Um, although when I was 10, I did choke out my brother with my legs in a triangle choke uh so we had a we had a fight and this was a sanctioned fight in the porter household um so don't get upset it was legal um (laughs) but essentially my dad was like all right you guys are mad at each other all right you're gonna fight here and here here and now you're no punches but you can fight go so it was just basically a wrestling match. And my brother, I'm assuming, I don't remember, he tackled me or something. And then next thing I knew, my legs were wrapped around his head and his face was purple. And my bro- or my dad was telling him to tap. He wouldn't tap because he's a psychopath, just like me. Um, and he never did tap, but my dad told me to let him go. And I was starting to get worried that I was going to kill him. I didn't know that he would just uh, pass out. But... Uh, I let go, and then my brother tried to keep attacking me. I'm like, bro, I let go. I wasn't trying to... I didn't want to kill you. Um, So maybe I do know something, you know? That's what I'm trying to say. Maybe I'm... No, I'm not. I'm not even going to go there. (laughs) I was going to say maybe I'm a reincarnation of jujitsu master, and uh, it just comes out, you know, when I need it, you know, I don't even need to do it, I just watch other people do it and mimic it, like a fucking robot, um, but as far as Megan Anderson, she is not that, (laughs) that's what I'm trying to say, I guess, um, and I mean, good performance by Felicia Spencer, uh, this was at 145 featherweight division, so there's like three or four fighters in that division, so, uh, or five, I don't know, what they'll do with it, um, but she deserves another fight if she be, you know, someone Megan who seems to be a UFC employee, UFC fighter, 
although she's now one and two, and her only win is by Dr. Stoppage, technically. I mean, the uh, ref stopped it, but, you know, it's because Megan fucking kicked her in the face with her toe. And I actually watched one of her past fights in Evicta, and it happened again. Or not happened again, it happened before. She kicked somebody in the face, and uh, it got him in the eye. It just barely glanced it. And I'm not saying she does it on purpose, or it's a technique she uses. It's not illegal. Because no one thinks, oh, you can, you know, guide your toe into someone's eye. Um, so, I don't know. I'm kind of butthurt that she lost. That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, for the co-main event, it was between uh, Antonio Shoeface, or it was between Shoeface, that's his nickname, Antonio Carlos Jr., and Ian Einish. I want to say his nickname. He had a good nickname, I thought. Um, they both had nicknames. The Hurricane Ian, the Hurricane Heinish. And I didn't know this, but he had been in prison before. And, and um, there's something about this dude. He just seemed fucking mentally and just morally strong. You know, it seems like he had been through some shit. He had been in a max, you know, a foreign prison, maximum security. And, uh,. You know, you can tell he's been through some shit, but man, this guy is a fucking Superman on the other side of it, for sure. Um, and I kind of first noticed in the pre, uh, the pre-fight the show that uh, ESPN does, it's on ESPN+. Plus, uh, and he just gave off that confidence, that aura, that is just very infectious, and you can just tell, oh fuck, this guy's... It's not that he's something special, and yeah, he. I mean, I think we're all special as human beings, but you can tell he's. He's just so determined and focused on what he, on who he is, and what he's going to do with his life, and especially with this fighting career. That uh, it's gonna be tough to stop this guy. Um, and he fucking showed out, and so did uh, so did Shoeface. Man, it was a good fucking fight to watch. Um, so this is the 12th night of the fight. Um, 12th night of the fight. 12th fight of the night. <laughs> uh, I think the first round I gave to shoe face. Had more grappling pressure and position. Um, and Although uh, Heinish did look strong in the scrambles. And look like he knew what he was doing. He had a wrestling background. Uh, Carlos Jr. is a submission expert. Um, but... Uh, so I definitely gave him that first round, but come second round, uh, Heinish had strong strikes, and he ended up on top. Um, uh, at the end of the second round, uh, Shoeface did have a majority of ground control, though. Um, so it was tough to tell who who won that uh, who won that round. I wasn't sure. Uh, Paul Felder, who's doing commentary on that on that uh, fight, thought he won that second round. Um, so I'll defer to him, but I, I gave it 9-9. Nine, nine. I wasn't honestly sure. In round three, I wasn't sure either. But um, definitely seemed like he was the fresher, more you know, the more fresh fighter and just more output and shit like that. Um, I scored a 9-9, nine, nine, but, uh, you know, Ian did have some power shots and great toughness. But Shoeface didn't do too much except for control ground, you know, the ground positions when they're on the ground. But he didn't land much damage when they were there. Um, so when they were on the ground, Ian did, a, I think, a good job of being very uh, defensive and making sure Shoeface didn't get any uh, punches off, any strikes off, or get any uh, submissions uh, set up. Um, so all three judges gave it 29-28 to Ian, and I could see that. Um... I'd be a little some more, more surprised if they gave to Antonio Carlos Jr. But uh, I think they got it right even though I gave it 9-9, third round. Even though I'm looking, or I'm not looking back on it now, but remembering now, and I think and by my notes, it seems he did more that third round. and So I think they got it right, and good performance by him. I you know, he fought a guy in Antonio Carlos Jr., who was number 12 at 185. So, I mean, I like to see Ian versus definitely a top 15, if not a top 10 guy. Um, the guy's young, strong, and determined. So, I don't even know if he's young. I just said that. He's 30 years old, but in the fight game, that's young. He's 13-1 in his MMA career, 14 fights. Uh, 
was only his second fight in the UFC. So he's young as far as his MMA and UFC career. Um, one guy that is not young in his MMA and UFC career is Javier de Soños. This being his, was his 40th professional fight? Jesus Christ. Um, and it fucking showed, man. God damn it, I'm fucking mad at myself. I really thought Kevin Lee would just go in there and do what Usman and Colby Covington did to him. Just take him down, hold him, get the cage, and, you know, just overwhelm him. But that wasn't the case. Um, and you could tell RDA definitely worked on his uh, takedown defense, his ground game. And I think it proved to me, and hopefully to Kevin Lee, that Kevin Lee's not as good as we thought. Um, and he's not as good as he thinks he is, that's for sure. This guy thinks he's a fucking on the cusp of being champion, and I don't think he is, man. He might be top 10 at, I don't know about 170, because this is his first fight at 170. He's fighting the number three guy at 170. Um, at lightweight, he was close to being a top five guy. I think he... You know, earned top 10, but then had some losses there. Um, so I don't know. I don't know where he goes from here. And I don't like... I didn't like his heart. And I don't like his messages after the fact of losing. He put, I didn't even read it because I knew it was just going to be sappy. And what was me attitude? And I get it. You lost a fight. You thought you were going to win. You thought your game plan was going to work. Um, but it didn't. And... When it didn't work, uh, I don't want to say he gave up, but he kind of did at one point. Um, as far as fight from the beginning to the end, um, uh, Kevin Lee actually had an early knockdown on RDA. He was actually he was getting a decent amount of him. You know, he was doing good on his feet versus RDA. So I didn't really expect he's solid on the on his feet, but uh, he's got that wrestling background. Whereas RDA, yes, I think he's a black belt in jujitsu. I'm not sure, but he does have jujitsu skills. Um, but he's primarily known as uh, being a striker with a very very high output, uh, especially since he's moved up to 170. Um, you know, Kevin Lee had a lot of cage pressure, uh, and then another takedown late. Or no, RDA had a takedown late. Um, and but I, I gave that first round to Kevin Lee. I thought he had more output and just outpointed RDA overall on the scorecards. Uh, come round two, RDA actually had a takedown and he had good sprawls and uh, defending off Kevin Lee's takedowns. Um, but Kevin Lee had nonstop pressure and he um, he had more output that round. So I gave that second round to him, but it was close. So I could see it going the other way, but it was a very evident, you know going through the second round and definitely, you know, halfway through that round that he was looking to tiring. Um, he was throwing a lot of strikes and a lot of output and um, using a lot of energy, throwing a lot of power shots uh, that weren't landing. And, you know, as he's throwing, RDA is not there anymore. Um, and it takes a lot more energy to fucking throw a strike, especially a power strike, and miss than it is to land, which I... I don't know, I never really put two and two together, I guess. I have, I mean, I've been in a handful of fights, but not, you know, a sanctioned professional fight or anything like that. Um, but just from hitting the fucking heavy bag I have here, um, every now and then I miss because I'm a fucking idiot. Um, and I'm like, damn, that was fucking really tiring because you think you're going to hit somewhere. You know, you think you're going to hit at X, but you don't. And the punch just keeps going all the way through. And so that same momentum that you were going to hit the bag or the person with and it's going to stop, you know, and that impact is going to meet, you know, unstoppable, unstoppable force. Can't, I don't fucking know. I was saying this. <laughs> what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? That's kind of that theory there. But when that unstoppable force hits nothing, it just keeps going and uses more and more energy until it dies out and you finish that strike with whatever power you had on it. Um, so that just makes sense. It just makes fix, uh, literally physical and sense by the definition of physics. Laws of nature, bitch. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, come that second round, Lee definitely looked like he was starting to gas. Um, and, and it showed that third round. 
Um, although I have it in my scorebook, 9-9. Nine, nine. Um, what the fuck did I write down? Yeah, second round I gave Kevin Lee. He was landing on the feet, but most of the round he had his back up against the cage. Come the third round, Kevin Lee had a takedown, and he actually had RDA's back at one moment, moment but uh, RDA reversed it and took Lee's back, and then he had a takedown as well, and he was starting to take uh, Lee down, which was crazy. Um, and then Lee also had another takedown, so they were just going back and forth, but it was very evident as Kevin Lee was trying to get these takedowns, that they weren't easy, that he was spending a lot of energy. Um, you know, there's several takedown attempts that he, he missed and RDA defended, and those get very, very tiring. Um, and you could tell you could tell in his face, you could tell it in his body language that it was very demoralizing. Um, you know, you go for a takedown, uh, RDA would stuff it, he'd stand up, <sighs> sigh, and then have, you know, that look on his face like, oh, man, come on, what can I do? And then, you know, try to do the same exact thing. Um, so, I mean, round three was kind of back and forth and grappling. But uh, just because RDA defended so many, many takedowns, and if I watch it again, I'd probably give him that round. Uh, and I'm probably being biased uh, knowing that I know how it ended up and turned out in the future. Um Speaking of that future, come round four, <laughs> um, RDA got kicked in the nuts. <laughs> I actually wrote that down. Um, Kevin Lee still had that cage pressure, um, but obviously was still gassing. And um, as RDA got out of, you know, defending the takedowns and getting out of harm as far as the grappling um, arena went, and then. Um, you know, he defended one of Kevin, and I think, before I go on further, I think uh, at the end of that third round, Kevin Lee went back to his corner, and he looked really distraught. He looked very demoralized. He looked almost depressed, man, like he was ready to give up. And he was just, I think, I don't know if he said it or if he mouthed the words, but he said something or or something along the line, like, what can I do, man? Like, I don't know what to do. And it seemed like he was freaking out. His corner was telling him to calm down. And it really seemed like he was starting to panic. Like, he knew, oh, fuck, I can't. I can't do anything. The game plan's not working. I can't take him down. I'm not going to win. I'm too tired. Da, 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 da. And his head was just starting to spin in that spiral. Like, if you're having a bad acid trip or something and you think you're dead or whatever, or you're living in a simulation, blah, blah, blah. Um, not that that's happened to me. Um... But, um, you know, RDA defended one of the takedowns, and Kevin Lee literally sat there and didn't move for a second. And just, you saw his body just lamp, go limp, and he was just, although he didn't see his face, you can tell he had given up at that point. That he had literally given up. And I don't know if RDA sensed it or not, I definitely think he sensed him starting to wilt and starting to tire. Uh, and, I mean, it was... You know, and I've never been in a cage match, but I feel like you, after, you know, and especially after three rounds, three hard rounds, um, you know, this is later in the fourth that this was finished. So after that, you know, I feel like you probably got a sense of how the other person that you're fighting, their energy levels and, you know, just their body language and how they're reacting to you. You know, if they still are exuding that confidence and you thought you just beat the shit out of them for four rounds, but they're still there, you're like, oh, fuck. But if you can tell he's breathing heavy and, you know, he doesn't want to look you in the eye anymore and he's like, you know, his shoulders are slumped, then you're like, okay, I got this motherfucker. And I think uh, when RDA defended that takedown and Kevin Lee kind of just sat there in fucking fetal position, you know, essentially saying, I'm done, uh, you know, with his body language, RDA got his back and sunk in. Uh, I thought it was a head and arm choke, but they said it was an arm. Uh, arm triangle so i'm gonna go with them the experts i don't know anything so he sunk that bitch in got the win three minutes and 47 seconds into the fourth round and i'm very upset at myself for not betting money on rda because he ended up being the fucking underdog and i was about to push place bet and then i fucking changed it and i didn't do it um so fuck me and 
lost my parlay bet because I'm an idiot and bet on Megan Anderson versus a wrestler, which is dumb. So don't listen to me if I put bets out. Even though the week before I got every bet right, this week I got them all wrong. <laughs> Even though I did bet on in the Hurricane High Niche. Um, but it was a minimal bet last second because I really didn't know. Because I hadn't seen either fight or fight. But just because of the off that pre-fight interview, I bet on him. Because I'm like, that dude just seems way too confident. <laughs> like, it's like he knows something I don't know. Um, and he knew he was going to win. As far as uh, performance bonuses, fight of the night was between Aspen Loud and Cichara Eubanks, even though I disagree with that decision. Uh, performance of the night bonus to Michelle Perria, the guy that I said that was breakdancing and throwing flying knees and spinning head kicks like 24-7. And also another performance of the night bonus to Grant Dawson. So congrats to all of those guys and ladies. Um i got about 10 minutes left here till we hit an hour mark. So, extra news, bitch. Um, if you know who Sage uh, Northcutt is, what was his fucking nickname? I forget. Kid Samurai or something like that? I don't know. Karate Kid. Um, but Sage Northcutt made his one FC debut, and he got knocked out in 29 seconds. Um, so him and Eddie Alvarez got knocked out in their debuts. Uh... And then uh, Mighty Mouse did get a win, but he got tested. And yeah, he definitely got tested. And, you know, I think it goes to show that these guys over there in 1FC, you guys over in China and, you know, the Asian countries, they're the fucking legit. Just because we don't know their names or can't pronounce them or we don't know their backstory doesn't mean they le- aren't legit fighters. They just don't live in this country. They weren't born in this country, so we don't know about them. There's literally one uh, female Chinese UFC fighter. Um, so, I mean, you know, the UFC is building a performance institute in China, so I think, uh, and I think it's supposed to be like three times larger than the one they have in Las Vegas, so I'm sure they'll get a lot of talent from there and start to build and things like that, so that's cool. Um, yeah, it goes to show there's legit fighting out there outside of the United States and outside of just the UFC. Um, speaking of not the UFC, PFL, Professional Fight League 2, it will be on this Thursday, so I look forward to that just because I'm interested in the season format. I don't know any of the fighters, but I'm just interested in how the points and divisions and playoffs go. And, um, I'm just interested, and it's something to fucking watch on a Thursday night. Uh, if you're not a fucking thirsty Thursday, you know, thought, um... As far as other UFC news, sadly, Tyron Woodley is out versus Robbie Lawler on the uh, Minneapolis uh, card from June 29th. Uh, It's because of a hand injury, I believe. Uh, I didn't get the exact details because I'm not a fucking reporter. So why are you asking me? Um, (laughs) And what was pretty cool... You know, I guess back backpacking off of that. Um, so switching to another news topic. Um, JDS, uh, Junior Dos Santos, will fight Francis Nagano, which they were already scheduled to fight, but they were scheduled to fight for on the July 4th weekend card, which I think is July 7th, I want to say. They were originally scheduled to fight for UFC 239. Um but they have now moved that fight to June 29th to headline the Minneapolis card uh, to replace Tyron Woodley for Robbie Lawler. Um, so I don't know if they're going to find a replacement for Lawler or what they're going to do. Um, so that sucks because I really want to see Lawler fight again. I was looking forward to seeing him fight versus Woodley. Because you get a fight versus Woodley and beat him, you're arguably the number one contender now. Um you know, Woodley's last fight was versus the champion. Or he was the champion. <laughs> and he lost the belt. Um, you know, Robbie Lawler's last fight, he lost a uh, submission uh, decision versus, uh, versus Ben Askren uh, with the bulldog choke. Kind of controversial. But if you listen to Herb Dean's explanation, and he, he talked about it on the uh, JRE, the Joe Rogan Experience, um, you know, now that I heard his explanation for why I ended it, I I think it was a good stoppage. Um, 
and I'm not going to go into detail there. If you want to listen to that, listen to that. Um, and a oh, fine announcement. Um, Andre Arlovsky versus Ben Rothwell will fight each other uh, July 20th in San Antonio. I don't think that's the main event. But what is the main event for that fight? Let's see. Schedule. But that's just scheduled, so two uh, heavyweights going at it. When is that? July 20th. Damn, I'm hungry as fuck. Can't wait to eat. Oh, it'll be an ESPN. Okay, so I don't know if they have. So right now, the main event is Liz Carmouche versus Roxy and Mona Ferry. We have Alexi Olenek, Walt Harris, Raquel Penny, and Arena it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good card there coming out of San Antonio. So it'll be two uh, exciting uh, heavyweight veterans going at it. Um, and to end it and close this episode, uh, Rashad Evans, Sugar Rashad Evans, the great UFC champ, former light heavyweight champion, uh, won the Ultimate Good fight, Fighter two, I believe, uh, at heavyweight. Uh, they announced during this uh, this week's card that he'll be inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame. So congrats to him. He deserves it for sure. And, uh, yeah, man, congrats. I don't know what else to say. And not only has he been a great fighter in this uh, uh, this organization in his UFC career, he's also been a great mentor and coach and... He uh, will join this, this uh, blah, 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 blah. the illustrious names of the UFC Hall of Fame, which they kind of just started, but you know, it's kind of cool seeing that they legitimately have a Hall of Fame now, and there's a decent amount of people. In it. Um, and they said they are going to build a f- physical location one day. Um, if they do, that'd be pretty cool to see um i'm trying to see who's all in the hall of fame right now and they have different wings they have the pioneer wing the modern era wing contributors wing and fights it's so pioneer obviously and we got hoist gracie ken shamrock dan severin randy Gator, mark coleman chuck liddell matt hughes tito ortiz pat militich boss rutin antonio rodrigo noguera don fry maurice smith Sakuraba and Matt Sarah. All those guys deserve it, man. Fuck yeah. Modern Era Wing, Forrest Griffin, BJ Penn, who's still fighting. Uriah Faber and Ronda Rousey. And then, I don't know the entire list of the 2019, but I know um, Michael Bisping and now Rashad Evans will be joining that modern Contributors, uh, a bunch of guys, fights. This, I'm just getting also Wikipedia, so I don't know if this is correct. And some fights there. Um, so that's cool. Congrats to Sugar Rashad Evans. And congrats to you for listening to me for an hour if you stayed up here. Unless to my monotone voice. You are. Uh, you must be born. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I love you. Um. Thanks for listening, and won't have a preview episode, as I said earlier, to start off this episode. Um, I definitely will have a Kyle High Club episode coming either tomorrow or another day this week. Uh, I haven't got around to it because I got super distracted this weekend. I came across a fucking video game that was free, and it was fucking, I got addicted to it, and I think I played literally 20 hours of it in two days. Um... And then yesterday, Monday, I was sick as fuck. I was throwing up water. I literally couldn't keep water down. Um, so that was fun. And that's why I didn't get this out of sooner. But it is what it is. It's life. As long as you do what you're supposed to do, and be nice to people, and spread as much positivity and love and knowledge. Um, and that's really all we can do, man. That being said, love you. And goodbye. Good night.
Peace. <laughs> Sayonara. Gracias.